15. That very day, two of them, two of the disciples, not two of the apostles, because we know later one of these gentlemen has a name, Cleopas, and he's not one of the apostles, but these are two of the disciples. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. See, these guys had heard about Jesus, had maybe from a distance even seen Jesus brutally killed on a cross and laid in a tomb. And they had come to a diagnosis as well. Jesus, like the other two, Jesus is dead. And even though Jesus is dead, they had come to the conclusion that life was still worth living. And this is a horrible, blinding, deceitful diagnosis. To come to the conclusion that says Jesus is dead, he did not rise, sins are not forgiven, and life is still worth living. It says that that day, that same day, that very day, verse 13 opens up with, so we know it's still Sunday. That Sunday, they take off, and by the construction of the, of the passage, scholars make the safe assumption that these men are not just going to visit Emmaus, they're going home to a place called Emmaus, and it's six stadia away, which is seven miles away. It's no joke of a walk. Seven miles is, is no joke, and so they, they, they take off, and they make the journey, and I'll tell you what, after what they'd seen on Friday, it, it, these guys may have, even, may have even been craving for the sun to rise on Sunday, not because they thought Jesus was coming out of the tomb, but because they could finally make it back to Emmaus. They couldn't travel on Saturday. It was against the law to travel on Saturday, so they couldn't wait for Sunday to come, so they could just go back to Emmaus, Back to life, go, 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 just, just, just get back in the groove, get back in the routine, tried the whole Jesus thing, didn't work, and they thought they could just go back to life. And it says they went back to Emmaus. And as soon as they could, they began the seven-mile walk, and they were prepared to go back and go about their everyday lives, you know, that stuff that we call real life. And you know how we, we fall into that deception? Here's church, and it's this artificial atmosphere, and we sing these songs that we'd never sing at home, and we feel these things that we'd never feel at home, and we speak with passion that we would never speak with at home, or, oh, God forbid, in public, and, and we know that these are, these are, are different but parallel realities because out there is real life. And these men were ready to return to real life now that apparently Jesus has been diagnosed as dead. So they're away on their way back to Emmaus. And while they were ready to leave, they weren't yet ready to drop the topic. I mean, to have been let down that badly, you, you don't just shake that. So the topic on the whole walk home, they had time and all the necessary fodder for a conversation that was just misery. So much so that it caught the attention of Jesus Christ Himself, not angels this time. Jesus comes and hears their conversation. Now, now, please don't miss this. If you were Jesus, if you were Jesus and you had just had the Friday he had, and your own creation had turned on you, and you willingly allowed them to dismantle you, you having all the power, all the authority, and every right to, to, to turn and just annihilate them. But lovingly enduring that for their sake and for the sake of nations, tribes, and tongues of all the ages to come. To be hung on a cross, laid in a tomb, and then Sunday morning comes. Victory is yours. Death is crushed. God is vindicated. Come out of the tomb. Are these the two guys that you want to spend your Sunday with? 
Angels in heaven and glory await. And there's these two doubting losers walking down a dusty road, going home to real life. And a loving Jesus between an empty tomb and an awaiting throne takes the time for two broken hearts, for two with shaken faith that might be you today. And he comes alongside them and he gives them help, help to overturn a horribly tragic misdiagnosis of who he is and what condition he's in. And he comes to them and he comes to us today. And he opens with a probing question. Giving them time to formulate and articulate an answer. You know how that works? Sometimes by the time you have to say something out loud, you realize how ridiculous it is. You can think a thought, but if you have to write it, you start saying, this is stupid. I'm embarrassed I was thinking this. He gives them time. He asks the question, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? Think about it. You're talking. You're talking about something. You're talking about someone. I, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, in a nutshell, encapsulate your feelings, your assessment of the situation. I want you to tell me the gist of what you're talking about. And once he asks the question, before they even spoke, their actions and their attitudes spoke first. You knew what the diagnosis was because the last part of verse 17 says that before they opened their mouths, it says that they stood still and they looked sad. This is the first Resurrection Sunday in history, and Jesus' disciples are standing still sad. The earth should have been splitting for the cheers of his own faithful, and there they are, standing on a road somewhere between their old life and their dead Savior, still and Sad, just seems wrong, huh? It just seems completely wrong for the children of a living God to be standing still sad. But standing still sad is oftentimes the condition of too many who claim to have walked with Him. Standing still, no more progress, not going this way or that way, just just stop. Just life at a halt and sadness has overcome me and the very thought of a failing Jesus, a Jesus who let me down, it just cripples them into paralysis. They just don't move anymore and they just sit there and look sad. We're then bubbling up inside one of them and not without a certain amount of edge to his comments. Notice how Cleopas chimes in, then Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? I, I guarantee you he regretted those words later. He turns and with a sharp tongue looks at this ignorant man. Who are, what rock did you crawl out from under that you don't know? Don't you, the whole world went dark for a few hours. And what happened? And he said to him, Jesus keeps poking. What things? Think about it. Think about how you arrived at the determination that I am not powerful. Think about how you arrived at the determination that I am not as great as I said I am, that I don't keep my promises, that my word is not true, that I am not the Son of God who came to save sinners. Think about it. What things happened that caused you to write me off as dead? 